Well, again, everyone, thanks for joining tonight. Uh, we're really excited to uh, welcome you to this event. Uh, it's no accident this is being convened at the Bipartisan Policy Center because the topic we're inherently talking about is not partisan. This is something that uh, affects you, whether you're Republican or Democrat or anything else. Um, my name is Nick Hart. I'm the CEO of the Data Coalition and really excited to moderate this uh, next part of the discussion this evening. Uh, you've already been introduced to Chad. Ann DeCesaro is the Chief of Staff in the Office of the Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services at the Department of Agriculture. Robert Shea, another former member of the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking, currently a principal at Grant Thornton, and Jason Saul, who you've just heard from. Um, for our panelists, we're going to talk for just a couple of minutes about what the future looks like in this conversation around evidence-based policymaking. You've just heard about the Evidence Act, the exciting work that's happening at GSA's Office of Evaluation Sciences, but they can't do this all by themselves. They're a not massive unit in government, and I think the takeaway is that there's a lot of need for those who are outside government to contribute to some of this work. Now, you all have lots of experience uh, inside and outside governments and thinking about some of these questions. And Jason alluded to some of the thorny issues around predictive analytics and how we think about program design at the very beginning, building in evidence, building in evaluation, building in data collection and management is just a core and fundamental feature to make sure our programs can work as well as possible. What's your sense of how important that really is? Is this going to totally uproot the model that we've been designing programs with for a generation? Chad, can I start with you? Absolutely, and so thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. To Jason, to Bruce, congratulations on uh, the launch of the center. Uh, I can tell you from a Canadian perspective, we are seized with this issue uh, around what is working and what is not working. And if you back up um, about four years ago when the uh, current government uh, first came into place, you could tell there was a direct emphasis on uh, the importance of evidence, on the importance of testing, on the importance of uh, evaluation and understanding what is working and what's not working. Uh, over the course of uh, the, that four years, and now uh, considering there is a new mandate for, uh, for the government looking into the, to the future, I think that, that work is absolutely going to continue. What I will say is that Jason's uh, diagnostic, if you will, uh, around what it's like in government to uh, essentially understand what's working uh, and what's not is a huge, huge uh, challenge to overcome. And I think that is going to be where a lot of effort is going to be placed uh, over the course of the next little while uh, in the Canadian government. What I'll say on the Canadian front, I sit at the center of government and we have a mandate to do uh, outcomes-based programming work. Uh, you can't get too far down the road of understanding uh, what an outcome is without actually understanding what the evidence is and what that evidence is telling you about whether it's working or not. And so you, you, you essentially run into a, a fairly thick brick wall fairly early on into the conversation. And uh, what I will say is a huge part of our work right now is to uh, work with departments, work with agencies to actually understand how they are setting themselves up uh, to be an organization that is grounded in evidence on how they can set up all of their performance metrics in a way to assess uh, the ongoing performance of their programs. And uh, we're excited about uh, working with them towards that goal. So I, I, I would say in the context of um, the Canadian government, we are uh, there with you lockstep along the way for, uh, for an ongoing and very bright future in the, on the side of evidence. Great. And so um, I'd like to kind of contrast where I was uh, like two months ago, working on the Hill and you know moving policy there, to now being in an agency and how um, sort of difficult it is. So you know um, on the Hill, I think policymakers are certainly there. They want to help, right? They they run for Congress or they run for positions or they volunteer themselves because they want to make a difference. Um, and I think um, there is frustration that they're not making a difference in the lives of of um, their constituents and Americans across the country. And so that motivates them to participate and to encourage evidence-based policy. Um, you know, we've done a lot of things on the Hill to set up new programs and making sure new programs have all of these things incorporated in. Um, now being on the back on the inside of government in the operational side, you realize 
that's just a small portion of what's going on. And so while you know we're not creating a lot of new programs right now, we're not creating um, massive new ways to do things. And so while we're making progress on those sort of smaller things where we are you know creating new things, what do we do about the big, large existing programs where you know no one's going to say like we're going to evaluate this whole thing or we're going to change you know how we're doing all of this, but there is definitely a better way to do it, um, and there's definitely things that we can learn. And so I think um, once you get into the operational side and figuring out how do you how do you bring that in and how do you make that part of not an add-on, but part of what you do as part of your daily routine. Um, it's a big behemoth that needs to move. Um, and so all the signals are coming from outside um, to these agencies. Um, we have to, it's, it's just, it's a lot of work. And so I, I hope 10 years from now we look back and say like, wow, we were, we were really in the Stone Age. And like, you know, but um, I think it's going to take more than 10 years. Um, but that's why we need to continue to do these things. And I mean, I'm so excited. I was talking to Jason when um, I first got here you know when I was in graduate school we were we were encouraged to go to the to the other um, uh, departments and learn about these things but you know you meet other public policy students who maybe you know have been more trained in sort of traditional reviewing of programs and you know we need to train the next generation to think about this as a science and to think about this as you know up front not this thing that we do after um, and so I think that is a big part of it is how we train the next generation so that they're asking these questions too and they're you know taking over our jobs you know in agencies and on the hill and you know and, and in state government too um, to question that and I think um, that is a huge part of moving this effort forward, um, is having just more people who, who know how to do these things and ask the right questions. Robert, so Nick, so your question is, <laughs> Sorry, can we predict, <laughs> can we? Well, no, I got us off track, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's great. You're, so your, your question though is really, can, it, what's, the, what's the benefit of being able to tell the future? Right. Of course. And, and so that's the holy grail, yes. right? Um, I would cash in on that. <laughs> uh, I would leave public service. Um, but uh, the, the the answer is clearly that if we knew whether or not our programs would work, that would greatly transform government operations. But you have to know what outcome you're trying to accomplish. Every bill, which is the primary way programs are created, has a section called a purpose. Um, and you can generally tease out the outcomes that are intended to be accomplished with that device. Um, but then there's a gulf between the enactment of the law, the appropriation of money to stand it up and, and run it. And pro, uh, we're 25 years into implementing an infrastructure for performance management of the federal government. The de definition of outcomes remains a real gap in the literacy of uh, public management. Um, for some reason, uh, what, you know, maybe because when the legislators who write those purposes uh, forget that that mattered, uh, when they continue to fund something that has their name associated with it, irrespective of its effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's enormous potential provided we can put it in the context of the measurable outcomes that we want to accomplish. Um, you know, Michael's story, uh, an incredible um, simple story that saved uh, an enormous number of lives. We probably don't have that direct link, but that's what happened. Prescriptions weren't made that would have led to the death of Americans um, as a result of this simple tool. And you're talking about um, uh, automating the ability to tap that evidence, which I do, I do think has enormous potential. <clears throat> well, Jason, does this resonate add, with you? I, just, I mean, I think these are great perspectives. I would just add one other point, I think, to build on what Robert's saying, which is that on some level, like, um, we've got the foundations for evidence-based policymaking. That's why it's called the foundations for evidence-based policymaking. But once we've laid the foundation, like, to what end, right? Like, evidence-based policymaking is an activity, not an outcome. What is the outcome? And I would challenge us to think about, like, what Robert's saying, which is the outcome is to get better outcomes from policy um, to get a better bang for the buck, to get a better ROI, to stop guessing and then measuring afterwards, to get greater precision, to help more people, all those things. And so thinking intentionally as we move this 
whole movement forward about ourselves being outcomes driven. What is the logic model for the evidence-based policy making movement? What is our outcomes? And how do we work back to make sure that our activities are designed to produce the outcomes? Because it's very easy to get lost in the activities for the sake of activities and doing evidence for the sake of evidence, right? And, and so making sure that we're continuing to keep our North Star clear. Yeah, interestingly, so you're, you're also alluding to some of the risks that exist in this work going forward. And I, I guess I'd be curious to hear uh, Chad, Robert, and Anne also weigh on this. What do you see as the big risks as we have this conversation in the next couple of years about the next steps? So I, I would say there's a couple of big things. Uh, one is there is a culture uh, that is going to be inordinately difficult inside of public services. I presume the US public service is the same as the Canadian one in that, in that regard, where whenever you start to shift uh, something in a new direction, it's almost like uh, there's a virus entering the system and all the white blood cells come out and start <laughs> wanting to kill it. Uh, and so, uh, so to put it very simply, uh, you know, culture will eat strategy every step of the way. And so, uh, so that, that is going to be one kind of big thing that needs to be overcome. I think the second thing is uh, that, you know, I guess at some level, all data is not created equal. All evidence is not created equal. Uh, but so therefore, us as policymakers need to actually become much more sophisticated in how we use that data how we interpret it into our narrative when we brief senior officials, when we brief political staff, when we brief ministers, uh, and then try to get that objective uh, accomplished by way of funding something that is evidence-based. So uh, it doesn't do, I think in our, in our case anyway, it doesn't do um, justice to say, well, the evidence says this, therefore we need to fund something. Uh, I think we need to take a step back and figure out how that evidence can be a building block inside of the narrative towards achieving something that is evidence-based. And that is a huge shift uh, in how we think as bureaucrats. We may think that we think rationally about things uh, in how we uh, do our jobs on a day-to-day -day basis, but, uh, but for those that are in those decision-making uh, positions, they're not thinking like us in, in that regard. So I think if we, if we look at those two things, uh, and if I actually think of the work that the center will do uh, and, uh, and what I would argue researchers and academics should do kind of generally is help us as policymakers uh, figure out how to understand that evidence and then, tr and then translate that into mm -hmm. something that can actually reach an effective decision at the end of the day. So one of my concerns about, or one of the risks, is that we actually stymie or delay innovation. Um, I think th the way um, sort of evaluation has been approached is this like, oh, we're going to use it to kill a program, right? This thing doesn't work, so we shouldn't do it, and we should do this other thing. But um, you know, what we need to be promoting is like, well, let's learn from what's going on there and figure out what we need to improve and what we need to change. Um, you know, We've set up some tiered evidence structures, and the idea is that you work your way up the structure. Well, that's if it works. But guess what? Most of the things are not going to make their way up the structure because most things don't work. But that shouldn't be like the time that we stop. And I am afraid that. Um, Folks who don't fully understand um, that getting finding out something doesn't work is just as value as finding out something does work um, could potentially lead us to to not continue to find answers. And so, um, you know, people it, we've seen this in academic journals, um, you know, where people shy away from publishing those results, and then somebody goes and does the same, you know, the same study again. Um, and so being okay with the idea that like, oh, this thing, we, we, we did learn some things from, you know, maybe not achieving all of our outcomes, maybe we achieved a few, and maybe we can learn about, and maybe there's a process thing, or maybe there's something else. And so um, I, do f I do fear that like as we produce more and more evidence, and people see that things don't, like, don't work, which is, is not a black or white issue either. Like, you know, it's not, um, uh, yeah, there's a range, and we need to we need to be talking more about that. Like, what can we learn from that, um, so that we don't um, delay potential innovation to really find out what does work. Yeah. So maybe something about like learning from failure. Yeah. Right? Is a positive thing. Well, I think yeah. what both of you were talking about is creating a learning culture yeah. in yeah. the government, mm -hmm. uh, which is a specific intent of the Foundations for Evidence Based Policy Making Act, and that I think the the agencies are working diligently mm -hmm. to create. I think policymakers not giving a damn is probably one of our biggest risks. Um, 
in advancing the Foundations Act, hearing from senior members of the legislature that efforts to improve the effectiveness of government were a waste of time was humbling for me as someone who's invested his life in this area. Um, so, uh, but there are also in my career uh, appropriators who are a major um, uh, point at which decisions are made about programs. Um, their hunger for insight into what's working uh, was not strong. So um, I, I think we need to nurture relationships and interest in among policymakers for whom this evidence is intended um, as much as we can. Uh, we need to really reward those people who show an interest in this arena. Mm -hmm. I would just add that I think you know, there's another constituency I think we've not touched on which is important. And that's the risk to the programs and the practitioners and the nonprofits that are doing all this work. Um, in many ways, the evidence-based movement can be seen as a regressive tax on small programs mm. who can't afford a fancy evaluator. So therefore, because your program hasn't been evaluated, you're not evidence-based. Right? And we need to solve that problem. I think it's a huge risk. It builds on Anne's point about innovation, which is, um, I would say, it's easy 98 to 99 percent of the programs that are running in this country, social programs uh, have not been evaluated. I mean, nonprofit programs, um, most of the programs that are the ultimate recipients of, of these large federal dollars. So what do we do in that case? How do we manage that risk? And I think it, it comes back to your point, Anne, about like, making sure that things aren't binary. It, it isn't, evidence-based policymaking is not necessarily a binary construct of you're evidence-based and you're not. It really should be um, a continuum in terms of to what extent is this program evidence-based? Even the programs that are RCT'd once um, are not truly evidence-based. I mean, they were evaluated, but I don't know if it's going to work again somewhere else with a different population at a different time, et cetera. So um, this idea of breaking up the binary and um, on some level exploding this binary contradiction of evidence-based not to something that's more of a continuum of to what extent you're evidence-based um, and also the what works versus what doesn't work or success or failure, I'm not sure that's the right analysis. This, the analysis should be, why do programs work? What's the machinery that's going on inside the programs? What's the DNA of when a program works versus a uh, program didn't? Oh, well, this had a limited dosage, or it should have had more parental involvement, or we needed a mentor, or we needed a greater frequency, or it needed some additional um, supporting services. Cracking the code and unpacking why programs are successful um, will ultimately, I think, uh, get us the distance that we're looking for versus here's a pile of studies that say this worked, here's a pile of studies that say it didn't. Um, so I think it's just sort of um, collapsing binaries and going into the kind of the, the continuum of, of looking at things so that we can mitigate the risk to the programs themselves who are stuck in this, this, this evidence-based trap. So I, I see a lot of heads nodding as you're making these remarks, and it suggests to me context matters. It always matters as we're thinking about designing programs, trying to make them work in the right place, in the right time, and for the right people. Okay. Um, having said that, I'm curious, so you all have a lot of government experience, and we're talking about a new center that will be on the outside of government working with you. Um, what can those who are outside government do to best support this movement and the next phase of the effort as it goes forward? Chad, we'll start with yeah, you. Yeah, so there's a there's an adage, uh, I shouldn't maybe say an adage, that indicates it'd be old, but uh, <laughs> we're very new. We've only been around for essentially a couple of years. Uh, but one of our, our guiding principles on how we work is that government alone can't actually solve the problem. Uh, we don't have the resources, we don't have the skills, we don't have the reach, we don't have the expertise. Uh, so therefore, we need to work in partnership um, with, uh, with all sectors of society, uh, depending on the, the context of the problem that we're trying to tackle. Part of, the, the, uh, part of that philosophy is actually working really, really uh, closely with academia, uh, with researchers, with those that know how to actually uh, develop and implement and analyze data uh, in ways that can actually come back and inform the implementation of, of programs that we're, uh, we're putting into place inside of uh, the federal government. And I think that is, that is an absolutely critical thing that, um, that is going to be important for our success moving forward. 
Uh, I'll also say um, that you know, in, in looking at how we move forward in collaboration with, um, with those people outside of government, um, we, have, we have a tremendous amount uh, to learn uh, uh, based off of the, the challenges that we have in our evaluation <coughs> community inside of the government of Canada. So much like Jason described about evaluations being um, post hoc in nature, uh, that's the way we have done it all the time uh, in, in the Canadian context. And we do need to find ways to uh, look at it from uh, uh, that, that progressive, uh, almost uh, looking at how we can implement something in real time where we can constantly make changes to how we are implementing based on the evidence that's coming through. And I don't think that we have that skill inside of government at this point in time, but we can and should if we are actually working in collaboration with academics, with centers uh, like this one that can, um, that can provide that level of expertise or provide predictive uh, modeling to, to help us be much more effective uh, and create a greater ROI for our program dollars spent. Well, Anne said we might be in the Stone Age, but it sounds like you might be in the bronze. <laughs> <laughs> that would be generous. <laughs> Anne, go ahead. Um, so what can folks on the outside do to help those of us on the inside, right? OK. So um, we, there's been a lot of lists put together. Like, you know, different agencies have lists of what works. Um, and so we like go to that and we're like, oh, these are the things that work. But I know there's like, there's a lot more stuff out there. Um, and uh, you know, DC becomes like a very, very small place. And so, you know, it's great with the University of Chicago being outside of DC. And, and there's so many researchers outside of here who are out there doing things, working with state governments, working with local nonprofits and things like that, and helping to um, bring that information back to us here in DC because it's so hard for us to keep track of all of that. And so, uh, you know, that is my ask of people outside you know, outside researchers, outside folks, um, to understand the challenges that we're the the challenges we're trying to solve, um, and help us collect from across the country where those best ideas are, um, and how we help those things flourish. Um, and so, I'm not looking to you know pick up something that's happening in you know small town Illinois and you know make it a national program. But how do I make sure that that environment exists in other places so something else can grow? Um, and so it's it's. It's context. It's like helping us understand what are the things around that. Um, and I think that goes to your external validity um, point, which is like, how do we make sure that these things do work in different places? Um, and while they may be different, you know, um, human beings are all different. And so they're all unique and they're all challenges, but um, there are common threads among those. And so um, helping us identify those so that we can create the environments for, for success. I would add to that, agencies will be publishing their learning agendas. Yeah, yeah. These will be the big questions that they want answers to. That's a perfect invitation. And, and they're all terrified that they're going to have this evaluation agenda with no money to complete it. So they need um, external sources to help answer those questions. And they won't all be um, outcome focused. They're going to span all kinds of questions to improve the performance and efficiency of their organizations. So we shouldn't uh, be snobs about the kinds of uh, help we provide agencies. And even the uh, agencies will publish evidence in ways that, if history is a guide, aren't the most accessible. So help translating that evidence into uh, usable information, um, I think, would be another important contribution. I'm going to pass it back to you, Nick. <laughs> well, um, we have a few minutes uh, left on the clock here for questions from uh, those who are joining us for the event. So uh, what questions do you have for our expert panelists? Oh. We do have a microphone. Somebody? Right, right up here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So I find it curious. Um, I think a lot about outcomes. And so you mentioned agencies have to declare a purpose. Um, I think there's conflation sometimes with purpose and outcome. And when you're thinking about definitions and why things don't happen or get lift off, I wonder if there's really a strategic objective you, you manage around. And then the um, individual will say key results are, out, are, are outcomes. 
right. is is there a way that organizations can feed each of those sub outcomes to make to make an agency appear that there's really this big strategic objective and not which isn't really your like in my view um, purpose is why you exist and outcomes support your existence that, that's right um, uh, I, I do think a lot of what we're talking about is assessing the extent to which our what our activities are helping you accomplish those outcomes organizations in government have a really hard time they have a they're pretty good at setting long-term outcome oriented goals harder to align what they're currently doing to those outcomes because many times sadly at least in the federal government there's a unit assigned to the strategic planning function that's separate and apart from people who are managing programs who are even farther apart than the people on the front lines actually manning the program i'm not sure i'm answering yeah, your so question but my fear is that that lack of integration um, will some of what we're trying to accomplish in, in shared data and shared information yeah so I, I guess what i'm trying to say is i think i mean you, you hit the nail on the head the lack of integration between strategic programming purpose, outcomes, um, how do we actually then utilize all the data you're going, this organization aggregates and shares all this, this information so that that becomes integrated and funding happens and, and outcomes actually materialize? So I don't think Oz, we'll, we'll never get to Oz. <laughs> um, we, we won't get to Nirvana. Nick will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, where all these are al are aligned perfectly, we'll never erase politics from the process in favor of evidence driving these decisions. But right now, we're filling the current gaps in evidence with a thimble. Um, one of the goals, the major goal, of the foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act was to create the conditions where people know what we're trying to learn, go about gathering that evidence with the explicit purpose of injecting it into policymaking. That's a pretty modest, it, as, as you mentioned, it's the Foundations Act. So pretty modest first steps, but still pretty ambitious in light of where we are today. So the, the integration, <coughs> seamless integration you're talking about, is this is a first step to that. So I think we've got one more question right here. Sometimes decision makers, um, they don't want to be confused uh, with the facts. <laughs> so, and that is a real risk um, uh, that, is, uh, that needs to be highlighted. So how do you propose we uh, deal with something like that? I can, I can offer a quick thought, which is I, I think you know, when we rolled out some of these ideas and, and the budgeting for results commission in the state of Illinois, um, people asked, well, you know, Policymakers and legislators don't always want to do what works. It's not always about doing what's evidence-based in those things. And so one of the things, at least my, my response at the time was, we don't need to necessarily force everybody to think a certain way, but I think it was Justice Brandeis who said, like, um, you know, sunshine is the best disinfectant. On some level, um, if we can smoke things out to say, that's fine. You can totally support this program. I just want to let you know that um, the cost per outcome of this program is $4,000. The average cost per outcome for uh, um, programs like this is $2,000. You can go ahead and fund it. You can go ahead and do it. But I want everyone to know that this is a complete diff uh, deviance from the benchmark, and the level of evidence to support it isn't there. So on some level, you can't control the decisions, but you can begin to put um, expectations around those decisions so that people are not, you're not micromanaging the decisions, but you're at least giving them benchmarks and guidelines and some comparison points along the way. Transparency. Transparency yeah. And transparency up front, um, I think every piece of legislation passed in Washington that funds every program should have a, an expected cost per outcome. As Robert said, it should name the outcome. There's only 132 common social outcomes in the world. We've codified them. Which one is it that this program is trying to advance? Is it trying to create jobs? Is it trying to get people job ready? Is it trying to reduce the incidence of uh, opioid addiction? Is it trying to graduate people from 
uh, high school to college? Is it trying to get more kids interested in STEM? What is the discrete outcome? What is the expected cost per outcome? And what are the core components that your program is using to achieve that? And how evidence-based is it? We got to know that ex ante. And I think there is a way to start smoking the stuff out, integrating it. And maybe this is the next version of the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, which is to require some of this information up front. Can I, can I just add one point onto that? So in Canada, we do not have an evidence-based policy uh, act of, of sorts. Um, so I'm going to approach this from a slightly different perspective. What I would, what I would say, and this, this is from a bureaucratic perspective on the implementation side, there is a massive gap between policy intent and the actual result that, that takes place at the end of the day. Uh, and so whatever process happens after, in the Canadian context, cabinet decides what the policy objective is going to be, and then the implementation takes place, and stuff happens in that process, and we get what we get. And nobody knows where that money went or what it bought at the end of the day. We can tell you how much we spent, we just, and we can tell you a bunch of stuff around activities. We just don't know what, the, what was purchased, uh, the outcome is at the end of the day. So from an implementation perspective, I think there is a lot to be learned from this. Uh, and I think we can and should, as a professional public service, be really focused in on how we can do our job better to ensure that that policy objective is obtained at the end of the day. And that can be done through ongoing evaluative approaches, the predictive type in nature, so you can constantly adjust kind of on an ongoing basis uh, towards the achievement of the policy objective. I think it can also be done through uh, I think greater discipline on uh, uh, getting away from the process side of things and much more focused on the outcomes. Uh, to Jason's point around understanding the outcome or understanding the cost per outcome, uh, it would be great if we could just cut through all of the activity-based uh, remuneration with our, our uh, service delivery providers and just say the cost per outcome is $2,000, therefore you've achieved this many outcomes, this is your, your, uh, your amount of funding that you get. And I think that might be a bit of a uh, kind of um, a longer term vision towards getting there, but if we don't have those conversations uh, as a professional public service, and as a, uh, uh, I think as professional implementers, we're, we're not going to shift that culture to the extent that we need. So we have one final question over here. So I'm going to try and make this short. One, thank you very much. All these insights are wonderful. But what we've seen is we need not only innovation in the opportunity to manage and oversee the impacts, we need innovation in the budget process. <laughs> so that has been a very <laughs> large challenge. But until The president we tie, did sign the continuing resolution. I would just like to say. <laughs> However, until we tie the impacts to the budget appropriation process, this will never actually be reality because there will be change issues through the entire organizational process, right? Even down to the, the person who manages the project. So until it's tied and until we have a real change in budget formulation processes, um, this is great, and we all want to see new impacts, and we all want to monitor and see real value from our programs. But it's it's going to be a it's going to be a climb. So more like a statement. Has anybody approached this? Well, as somebody who's invested dog years <laughs> doing trying to do just that, um, uh, it is not unrealistic to expect performance evidence to influence the budget process. Um, to uh, institutionalize it, um, to require it mechanically is a much bigger lift and I think maybe beyond expectations. The transparency that we talked about, th these are policymakers who um, don't want facts to get in the way of doing their work, are going to have to be influenced by the transparency of the evidence that is produced through this movement. Cool. And former OMB staffer, you want to put yeah. that hat well, back on? Well, I mean, there's lots of that up here. Um, no, I mean, um, it, it is. It's always asked about, but at the end of the day. Always asked about? It, it, I mean, uh, every, I was going to say, all the papers I wrote for director's review did have, um, you know, those 
things involved. Um, and you know, it's it's interesting listening to the like the cost per outcome pieces because that's how we we build budget estimates, though. You know what I mean? Like you you figure out how much is this thing gonna cost. You know, you talk to the folks at CBO or OMB of how they're scoring things. It's well, how many people do we think, and how much do we think this thing is gonna cost? And so it's like it's it's kind of inherent. And so I think there's a little bit more going on than might actually you know might, than it might appear. Um, but you know, uh, it, it's always been asked about. I think it's always you know sort of, you know, in the formulation process, going back to agencies and each level that it goes through, whether it gets used, I think is another question. But like, I think it's it's at least asked. Like, if you have it, you should provide it. But we don't always have it, so that goes back to how we're how we're yeah, and how we're running these programs. So. Well, it's interesting hearing you yeah. say this because in the regulatory process in the United States, we require a lot of prospective yes. analysis and think about yes. all of these questions. Yes. And that hasn't manifested as much in the budget process. Yeah. So then there's this question yes. of how do we change our legal infrastructure, yeah. uh, maybe as we're considering new laws in Congress, yeah. or yeah. the budget formulation itself yeah. to better embed this. And that seems to be yeah. one of our great challenges yeah. as we go forward. That's all the time we have for the panel. So for those that are here and joining us, please uh, join me in thanking our panel for their insights. I just want to uh, just want to say a closing remark, and, let, uh, and then we'll close out. Um, thank you for the panel. Um, thank you for everyone uh, making the time to come here at, at great length, um, and thank all of you. Uh, we are outcomes driven ourselves at the center, and our outcome is to engage you and to figure out how can um, we convene you, how can we answer questions that you're looking for, how can we fund the research that will help you, how can we provide fellows to help you answer the questions that you're looking for. So my call to action is to contact us, there's content information on the brochures, and let us know how we can help. Um, are there researchers that you want us to fund that will help provide, advance the science? Are there fellows that we can help? Um, um, generate for you, are, and are you interested in um, convening these types of conversations and joining us for the next one? I hope you are. Thank you very much.